Welcome to this time of worship. My name is Melissa Bailey Kirk. I'm the pastor at Gashland United Methodist Church in the Northland of Kansas City. We at our church are in the last week of a worship series called Navigating Uncharted Territory, where we've used the journey of Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery as a metaphor in a conversation with scripture in exploring the ways that God is with us journeying with us when we find ourselves in unfamiliar places, in uncharted territory. It took them 19 months, 19 months of traveling across uncharted territory of what we know as the United States of America. But finally, Lewis, Clark, and the Corps of Discovery arrived at the Pacific Ocean. After 19 months of discovering painful path by painful path that all of their maps were wrong. 19 months of having to lay down their assumptions and along the way their canoes and other supplies if they were going to remain faithful to their mission. 19 months of learning the hard way that they did not have all the answers. But after 19 months, the mission was accomplished. And we might imagine, I might imagine, that upon arrival at the westernmost coast, they would update their journals and their maps and settle down to wait for the ship that would come and carry them back east, looking forward to returning home by boat, avoiding the anguish and suffering that they had endured to get where they were to that coast. I might even, were I they, consider taking up residence on the West Coast, tossing my hiking boots in the fire, slathering ointment on my blistered hands and feet, and just call it a day. Lewis and Clark decided differently, however. After waiting out the winter months, they secured additional guides and created two expedition parties for the return home. Lewis and Clark separated from one another, each of them taking half of the core of discovery with them. One group would travel home via a northern route. The other group would travel home via a southern route. Neither group would travel home the way that they had come. And their hope, their plan, was to meet up at, in about six weeks at the confluence of the Missouri and Yellowstone rivers. Even after 19 months of hard, hard travel, these were still explorers, and there was more exploring to be done, more flora and fauna to be discovered, more maps to be developed. It's hard for me to imagine a commitment so steadfast, so relentless, that one is willing to intentionally put oneself in harm's way, to knowingly step into uncharted territory, and all of the disorientation that it causes, the adaptation that it requires, it's hard for me to imagine. Then I consider Paul's letter to the church in Rome. At the time of his writing, the followers of Jesus in Rome were a hodgepodge of Gentiles and Jews who had recently returned to Rome after an exile. And understandably, there was tension within the church at Rome. It seems that some Gentile Christians were less than enthusiastic about welcoming their Jewish brothers and sisters back into the faith community. This was an adaptive time in the life of the church. First of all, there was no map. There was no guide for communities of people who are following in the way of Jesus. There was a person, Jesus his message, his example, his teaching. There was scripture, there was Jewish scripture, there were letters being circulated among new faith communities, there were stories told around dinner tables. The first followers of Jesus had no map. There was no um, United Methodist book of discipline. Some thought only Jews were in, some thought only Gentiles were in. But in spite of this disagreement, Jews and Gentiles alike had discovered something in the good news that Jesus embodied, something life-changing, something transformative. It was true then, even as it is true now, that change is not easy, that transformation is not easy. It's exciting and it's difficult. It's renewing and it's grievous. It's longed for and it is avoided. Paul's letter to this struggling church is 
a letter of encouragement, something for them to turn to when they were tempted to resist the transformation that life in Jesus brings, something for them to lean on when they were tempted to lean away from the exploration and discoveries that waited for them, when they were tempted to stop at the edge of uncharted territory and choose familiarity over faith. In the first eight chapters of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Paul lays out his understanding of God's saving work through Jesus Christ. With the remainder of that letter devoted to moral teaching and a call to universal accountability before God, an appeal for holy living within the church and within the world. Today, I'm going to be reading from the message paraphrase the first two verses of the 12th chapter of Paul's letter to the Roman church. Paul wrote, So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you and develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm wondering if the Roman Christians were struggling at this point with spiritual apathy. You know what I mean, that feeling that plagues us when we believe that we have finally arrived, when the excitement has faded, when we begin to wonder if that's all there is, a sort of spiritual adrenaline crash. In our bodies, adrenaline is what gives us energy and sharp thinking we need to get stuff done, to respond to a threat, to give birth to and raise babies, to make it through a demanding season. But our bodies would be damaged and are damaged by consistently high levels of adrenaline, so there's a point at which those levels have to recede, which is when we may begin to feel actually depleted, uh, disappointed, and if we become dependent upon adrenaline rushes for energy and sharp thinking, we might even develop cycles of thrill-seeking behavior in order to keep those levels of adrenaline high, which is not at all how our bodies are designed to function. And in the same way, God did not design our spirits to sustain a constant high which may have been part of what po prompted Paul to write to the Romans. Take your ordinary life, your ordinary life, and place it before God as an offering. Rather than worry about who is in and who is out, what others are saying and what others are not saying, give what you've got to God and watch God change you from the inside out. Lewis, Clark, and the Corps of Discovery, they were given a huge mission by President Jefferson to find a water route that connected the Mississippi River with the Pacific Ocean. And over the course of their 19-month journey, there were, no doubt, numerous highs and just as many lows. Moments when their eyesight and their reflexes were supernaturally responsive to some challenge in front of them, and just as many moments when each step felt like the last one million boring, unexciting steps. What was it then that caused them to, to sign up for more of the same? After all, their mission had been accomplished and they had more than earned their rest and reward. Why would their, they voluntarily arrange to split up and return home by unexplored unfamiliar, uncharted territory. 
I believe it is because they discovered more about themselves on their trip west than they did about the land that they traversed. They learned that they, at their core, were so much more than a group of people assigned a task, more than people who explored. They were on a cellular level explorers, adventurers, map makers. During the course of their initial journey west, they were transformed step by step obstacle by obstacle, adapt adaptation by adaptation. And through this transformation, they were able to inspire others to set the pace. They discovered their innate capacity for adventure, for risk taking, for seeing beyond the maps and their assumptions. They discovered their innate capacity to navigate uncharted territory. This is what Paul is referring to when he wrote of well-formed maturity that God develops in us when we entrust all of us, the ordinary parts of us and the extraordinary parts of us, to God. Well-formed maturity comes as we allow God to enliven in us our true self, the self that God created, the self as God dreams. For a follower of Jesus, this means the shift from wearing the proverbial cross that identifies us as a believer and being a disciple who bears the image of God, not on a necklace or a bumper sticker, but within our very being. For God to develop this maturity within us, we must, Paul says, give ourselves and our focus to God and allow God to change us from the inside out. In his book, Canoeing the Mountains, Todd Bolsinger suggests three ways that you and I might open ourselves to the ongoing transformation that God desires for us. First, focus on our own transformation rather than worry about the church's transformation or our spouse's transformation or our pastor's transformation or our child's transformation. Invest our energy in tending to our own spiritual maturity. Rather than look at others, look at ourselves and ask, are there gaps? Are there gaps between the way of Jesus and my own words, my own actions, my own attitudes? Then watch and listen as God reveals those gaps to us because they are surely present and they are obstacles to our spiritual maturity. Second, focus on the terrain ahead of us, not what is behind. The truth is that where we are right now and what is in front of us look very different from what is behind us. The old ways will no longer work if we are going to remain, remain faithful to the vision that God has planted in the church I serve that Gashland United Methodist is an inclusive church transformed through life with God and one another and through that transformation, anticipating, recognizing, and responding to the needs of the community. As each of us focus on our own spiritual transformation and in, on what is front, in front of us, we have to ask ourselves, what losses do I need to face? Or what losses do I need to prepare myself for in order to keep moving in the direction that God has for us. And then listening and watching as God reveals those losses with us and journeys with us in our grief. And then finally, we need to focus on ongoing and continuous learning. We are all masters of things, aren't we? Many of us have taught Sunday school for years and years, but we've never taught Sunday school in a pandemic. Many of us have been church leaders for years and years, but we've never led a church through a pandemic. Many of us have parented for years and years, but we've never parented through a pandemic. Many of us have been teachers our whole lives, but we've never been a teacher during a pandemic. We are called 
if we are to offer ourselves for transformation, we are called to take the energy and the sense of adventure that inspired us to master what we have mastered and apply it to what we don't know. Apply that energy and sense of adventure into learning what we do not know. Who are my new teachers? Who are my new mentors? And then listen and watch as God places in our paths those who have the knowledge, those who have the mastery needed to teach us what we need to learn. It is true that God is eager to reform us, to bring us back into wholeness, to change us from the inside out. God is eager to restore us. I want to invite us to a few moments of silence. And in that silence, wherever you are, just take these few moments to reflect on the question, what, what is the transformation that's required of me right now? What's the transformation that's required of me right now? Just take a moment where you are. transforming and loving God. Speak to us of those places in our lives and spirits that have settled, that are drained, that have forgotten you. Show us those places in our lives that need your touch, that need your transforming power. And give to us, God, the desire. Give to us the desire to accept the courage that you offer so that we can lean into your transforming presence. Amen. Peace, my friends, and all good.